One of the most controversial violent video games in recent memory was created by a 25-year-old Colorado man named Danny Ladoni. His game is called Super Columbine Massacre RPG. You may have guessed that it is based on the murder of 13 people at Columbine High School in Colorado in 1999. In the game, the player assumes the identity of one of the killers, Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold. The player goes on to overcome certain obstacles to commit the crime. He then dies and battles demons in hell. Have a seat. This is Video Game Politics. I was asked to speak today about a video game I created a bit of time ago. My name is Danny Ladoni, by the way. I'm 25. I went to a Colorado high school, and um, I was in 10th grade at the time of the shooting at Columbine. And it had a um, pretty profound impact on me. I was looking at these two boys who I saw perhaps too much of myself in. And because after the shooting, there was so much scapegoatism to go around in terms of certain kinds of music, video games, just generally these marginal aspects of our culture that I was into. And while I had a childhood of playing video games, I certainly didn't imagine myself making one until I found a free piece of software called RPG Maker that you can use to make your own game. And then I began to think about this whole childhood of video games I've been playing had informed my sensibilities about what games are and what games could be. I asked myself, if I want to spend the next six months making a video game, I want it to be something that matters. I want it to be something that's personally important. And I needed an internet connection, some free time and devotion, six months of research and development. I put it online at columbinegame.com. I didn't know if anyone would ever play it. All I did was send the link to the game to about a dozen of my friends. And I said, if this interests you, check it out, pass it on. Honestly, when I heard that he had made a game called Super Columbine Massacre RPG, I was a little bit, uh, a little bit nonplussed, um, although the exclamation point was oddly comforting. My first concern was, had Danny committed career suicide? And if he hadn't, then I had a, I had a good idea that it would probably be an intelligent game. I didn't promote this. In fact, I submitted it anonymously. For over a year, no one knew who, no one knew who made this game. I didn't know if I'd lose my job, okay? For, for all the, the reasons that I think you came in this evening already imagining, uh, there are a lot of people who do not like this game and furthermore uh, are, are deeply offended by the fact that someone would make it. Honestly, the purpose of making the game, one of the primary ones, was to get people talking about the subject of school shootings. ColumbineGame.com has a discussion forum where people can go and talk about the game. I just wanted to put this out there and sort of see what kind of feedback the game got. After you know playing the game, reading the things on the, the website about how we wanted it to, you know, educate people, you know, through making the game as real as possible and showing images and you know talking about the situations and how they affect people. And I didn't agree with the fact that he wanted the game to affect other people personally without it affecting the creator personally. I sent a. I would say pretty rude email. It was a my two cents donation through PayPal. Uh, I figured that was the only way he was going to get an actual email from me. Took the username from that email address, put it in a search engine, and he's used that username on a bunch of other accounts that has his real name as well. Location, business name, everything else. One search onto another, find what you find, put it into another search engine. Phone number, address, put it into Google Earth. I even got a picture of his house and you know, knew that the train tracks went right by it and put all that information on the internet. At that point I knew that I'd struck a nerve and I'd guessed the right person and um, told the newspapers. I'm putting your information in the public. You need to apologize for having made it. I was like, all right, I can either do that or I can own up to what I've made. For good or worse, I think he needed to step up and um, you know, voluntary or not. Um, take what's coming to him. I feel it is my responsibility to explain what I've made and engage in discussions with audiences as to why. I've done that through my website, I've done that through the press, I've done that by making my email available, and in some sense I'm doing that by making this film. After so much press where I'm, you know, on the other end of the phone or the other end of the interview, I thought it was time to sort of pick up my own camera and tell the story from my perspective and bring along with me a lot of other people who saw different avenues in what the game was doing or not doing.
Danny Ladoni is the creator of the Super Columbine Massacre RPG. Yes, that's the name. Okay, get over the name, right? Because it's hard to get over the name. Everyone, the first time they hear the name, they go, you know, WTF, what is this guy doing? They don't understand what he's doing. People assume just by the title that it was a big sort of doom style shoot em up running around with your shotgun blasting and everything in a very kind of visceral action packed way. The exclamation point is very easily read by people who are coming at it from outside gaming as like some sort of celebration like yes let's go in there and let's massacre our classmates. The title itself would not work as Columbine or even Columbine with a little exclamation point. It has to be lengthy enough for you to stop and think about it. People ask me, why did you call it Super Columbine Massacre RPG? I feel like the next question is, why did they call it Super Mario Brothers? It's satiric when you clash the, the beginning and the ending with Massacre, let alone with Columbine. All right, let's see this. Clearly, Columbine is a subject that we're interested in talking about. It's not as though I dug up this subject that no one ever had considered exploring artistically. However, no one had done so with the video game. Given that video games were one of the forms of media that were implicated in sort of motivating the whole tragedy, I think nobody really knew what context to put it in or how to take it. There's not a lot of context even in the game exactly for how, how you should take it. And gamers themselves, as well as the mainstream media, weren't used to playing games that weren't really just about entertainment. It, that was still somewhat of a novel concept. I think that it's so polarized because it's on a topic that's so recent. I understand differing perspectives on when society is ready for a game to cover X, Y, and Z. So I definitely hear both sides. I totally understand. You know, there was someone who was at the event who was from Colorado, and she said, you know, I was in high school when the Columbine shootings happened. How could you make a game about this, right? And I mean, I understand her side. I understand she's coming from a very emotional mindset. You know, I think my quote in the, the Washington Post was, you know, people are going and killing Rachel over and over again. And it's just, it's hard for a lot of people. I can think of no sicker way to amuse or entertain oneself than to practice killing people for fun and points. You are sick beyond belief. I hope you choke on every penny. People wrote that there was no game that could be made about Columbine that could be legitimate. Different people have different stories and different ways of telling their stories about that event. And I think the video game was just another way from another person to tell that event. There was a tremendous amount of pressure to take the game off the internet, to apologize publicly for having ever made it, acknowledge that it was in poor taste, and basically roll over and, and never, ever do anything like this. I think the fact that it's called a game, a video game, was uh, part of the reason why it pissed so many people off. Because the game in itself wasn't entertaining. It was thought-provoking, but it wasn't entertaining at all. Although from a cultural perspective, video games are this new medium, they're a new industry. This element of play that they draw on that is what makes them compelling um, is something that's actually very primitive. Play is just a name for, for exploring the constraints of a system. If we look at play that way, then it really has nothing to do with childishness, it has nothing to do with fun, certainly, and it has nothing to do with amusement and leisure. It, it just means that we've, we've got some system of rules and we're asking questions about them. Gosh, what happens if I do this? What if I change this behavior? In every medium you have products that are designed purely for the entertainment value as well. The real thing is there should be room for other stuff. The Columbine game is something very important to push the boundaries, and really this just opens up more opportunities in the long run for the games industry because now maybe we're going to see more opportunity to have a thematic game, have something that you know details real events, and I can only imagine that as being something good to expand the industry. I guess I felt very almost like sad and lonely moments, feeling how alone these, these kids must have felt as they were preparing to do this. I downloaded it, then I started thinking, should I play it or not? If I play it and I enjoy it, does, does that make me a bad person? And I said, screw it, and I just started playing it. If it was depressing and kind of freaky, just afraid that my dad would walk in and say, what the hell are you playing? It's an interesting mirror for individuals 
because I've seen some people who approach the game and they play it and they're just kind of like they just kind of like chuckle and they they just think it's like really fun and funny and, and there's some people who really abhor the idea there are some people who are very serious about the way that they approach it I think that says a lot about individuals I guess it's redeeming value in a, in a general cultural sense is that it helps you understand something very very alien to your own life and your own experience and that's incredibly enriching and I think you ultimately become a better person from taking that into yourself, even though it's difficult. I didn't automatically assume it was like a negative thing, I guess, you know, like a lot of people did. I guess I couldn't imagine someone making a video game that made it look like it was a fun thing to do, I guess, which, you know, I don't think it, I don't think it is. I don't know, it kind of hits at home, I guess. Like it makes it kind of, I think it makes it seem like it is like based on a real event, you know, it's just not some trivial thing or some trivial game, I guess. I feel like it's almost more like a documentary than a video game. Certainly, I learned more about the Columbine Massacre in the one hour I spent watching somebody play this game than I had learned in all of the mainstream media articles, including the movie Bowling for Columbine, a documentary. You don't gain appreciation for the tragedy by repeating it and participating in a recreation yourself and taking the role of the murderers. We're just learning how to use games as an expressive medium, so there's no real model to say how do you sensitively reenact a tragedy like this. Even though I didn't personally like the game, it's still something that's respected. It's still like, it's still art, you know? But it won't be art to some other people, as you can see. In my personal opinion, it, it didn't follow suit at all of what the creator said it was made for, and it struck a nerve, made me mad. I must personally applaud the guts it took to put this out there, and can only imagine the mix of responses. When it was released, it was not released just as a download, and, and you know, here you are, do what we fit what we want. But there were forums where the players could actually express their opinions. That kind of feedback loop between reenacting but discussing is what makes the game, in my opinion, highly ethical. It is wholly inaccurate to say that this is somehow a, that the game itself does virtue to the tragedy. The controversy should be that there aren't more games like Super Columbine Massacre RPG that are as demanding and as artistically innovative. Yeah, Danny's game was really the first uh, game I ever found but that had like a real world message like that. I didn't realize when I made this game that there was actually a movement of video games out there called serious games, games with an agenda, persuasive games. Last year we had a game made about Darfur, Darfur is dying and really very difficult topic. And when Susanna Ruiz, who made that game, first came to the faculty and said, I want to make a game about genocide, is what she said. And everyone was like, oh my god, you can't make a game about this. She was certain that she wanted to address this topic. And so then what we did was spent the time of her thesis development really talking about how to put the player into a moment of empathy with that particular crisis and find individuals who could represent that crisis. The only thing I could call is a fantasy of disempowerment to allow the player to empathize um, with the people going through this. And then trying to turn that, that sense of disempowerment into activism at the end. We went on that journey from, you can't make a game about this, to, of course, you have to make a game about this because it's the only way to reach a certain uh, group of people. This game called September 12th where you're, uh, you're bombing this Middle Eastern city and the more you bomb the more terrorists you actually create. You know, back on the Commodore 64 there was a freeware game released where you were a guard in a concentration camp killing Jews. Though it was about something controversial it wasn't uh, really trying to explore it in any sort of way that contributed anything. Ryan Lamborn says he created the game VTech Rampage because he thought it would be funny. I find it funny, I mean people call me for that, but I don't really care. <laughs> Anyone who tries to make a game solely for the controversy is clearly wrong-headed. The idea was to express a critic complessive of the industry of fast food, practically recomposing the various sectors, the various parts of this process dispersed globally, so from dal pascolo al, all'allevamento, alla, alla, alla vendita diciamo, del fast food. Non eravamo particolarmente soddisfatti della solita critica che si usa fare al, 
all'industria, alla corporation McDonald's, cioè il fatto di vendere cibo scadente, di vendere cibo insalubre. So we've made games about the questionable efficacy of contemporary airport security practices or the relationship between agribusiness and food safety. Uh, but I've also made games in which, you know, you are a, a kind of a disgruntled worker at a copy store, right? So there's all sorts of ways that we can, we can kind of gain empathy for different people in different situations. Excuse me, you, you have a video game that takes place in a copy store? Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, is, it, is it designed to bore you to death? <laughs> Well, it's interesting you, you bring up the idea of boredom, right? Because normally we think that games are supposed to just be fun and distracting. But yeah, that's, I'm funny that way. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> no, so I'm saying that we can do more than just have fun with games. We can also get ideas and we can also kind of, you know, feel what it's like to live someone else's life. The fact that there aren't more like this, that there aren't more like Disaffected, that there aren't more like Madrid, like September 12th, that there aren't more like Darfur is dying, is the real controversy. The problem is not Super Columbine Massacre RPG. The problem is, is that we have not become accustomed to works in this genre. Really, as video games get cheaper to make, as they can be distributed on the web, it's more and more possible to make games with an agenda um, that don't merely entertain people and, and kick back a profit to the companies. Games are currently a very touchy issue in the public discourse, partially because people don't understand them very well, partially because they are viewed as children's toys and not as a legitimate form of art. Lawmakers, parents, politicians, etc. had a difficult time assimilating how a child's toy could somehow now be used for a mature purpose. It would be like distributing it an anatomically correct version of Barbie. If your mental model of a game or a movie or a television show is toy for child or entertainment for child, you wouldn't even consider the fact that there'd be a rating system. A hustler is sold on the shelf, yet something that's not, not even close to the explicitness of hustler is contained in a video game and the whole world falls apart. Gamers are painted especially by politicians as pimply faced kids when in fact the average age of a gamer is now 31 or 32 years of age. They say, well, you know, the average gamer is older, the average game is actually rated to E or T. That is a red herring. They keep, they keep deflecting the issue to again protect their own uh, financial interests at the expense of children. I think it sets the wrong example for children who are being shaped by external factors, uh, including the things that they're exposed to. And today we see video games, are not the sort of video games I played uh, as a kid a long time ago. People who are over the age of, say, early 40s, who are part of the baby boomer generation, didn't grow up with games as part of that content that they were used to. And so they looked at it as a toy, something that their children or their grandchildren play. Would I want my kid playing Danny's game? He's six years old. Not at this point. Would I show it to him when he's 15 and he's going through a hard time and you know he's getting bullied at school or whatever? Yeah, I would. Because I've, I've looked at it and I know what it's about. Maybe we could come up with a version of Columbine that kids could play with their parents. Maybe there wouldn't be such an angry, hostile reaction to a game that provoked the same questions in an environment where they might be answered together. It's kind of easy to understand why the parents doesn't play those games in the past. For example, like Mario. If every time you die three times, the game reset. What can you achieve? What can you gain? You know, as from an adult who is really busy in their life, they are not going to play it. But as us, we were kids, you know, we have time, we can try, we can mess around. Whenever youth culture adopts a new genre, it's viewed as potentially scary by older people. That was true with comic books, it was true with rock and roll, it's now true with games. Back in the 80s, we had a huge controversy over uh, whether Dungeons and Dragons was demonic and evil. So I kind of feel like I've lived through this scenario before. Early days of film, I mean, these things were corrupting the youth of America, they were horrible, they were tools of the devil. They'd play these uh, records back and they would uh, See? He Satan. just he, he just read the first chapter of the Satanic Bible. Didn't you hear that? I'll play it for you again. Did you hear it? No, I didn't hear anything. And so you kind of get this this pattern of moral panic. This pattern of the older generation fearing and not understanding the younger generation's pop culture. By the year 2010, there are going to be about 75 million people in this country between the ages of 10 and 30. That's going to be more people between 10 and 30 than there are baby boomers. Every single one of those 75 million people will have grown up with video games. It's in their DNA. There will be no such thing as a gamer. Just like we don't label people who listen to their iPods as listeners, or someone who watches TV as a watcher. People in their 40s and 50s and 60s, people in power, people who edit papers, people who run television stations and put up all sorts of negative video game stories without ever dealing with television violence. This isn't their world. 
But you know what? In 10 or 15 years, guess who's running the country? All those people growing up with video games. We're gonna have a president of the United States in 20 years who was a gamer. Probably played Grand Theft Auto when they were a kid. news from a college in downtown Montreal under fire. The Associated Press now says the suspect has also shot himself. Well, basically I was minding my own business in the cafeteria and uh, this guy came in, dropped the bag, started pulling out guns and next thing you know I'm running and kind of felt an electric shock because uh, as I turned the bullet went in through my arm and shot through my chest, leaving six holes. So basically, yeah, you know, I ran. I think the thing that I remember the most is that while the shooting was taking place, I wasn't afraid, really. I, I guess I didn't really believe that it was happening. It just seemed so impossible that there could be a shooter in Dawson. My girlfriend, who I was with at the time, got also, she got shot too. So, uh, you know, she was basically fainting in and out between life and death. So uh, luckily I knew first aid. So we managed to keep her going long enough. This is the area where Kim Virgo had his last breaths. The doctor, he, he looks at my x-ray and he goes, Oh shit man, you're one lucky motherfucker. Those words exactly, and I'm never going to forget it because this is a doctor. I'd say just the entire event was complete confusion. My girlfriend was on a stretcher and it's like camera flashes everywhere, everything. I was just completely disgusted. And I kind of, I was really mad at basically any press that was covering the event. They'd say that, you know, oh, four of the victims are in critical condition, and it wasn't even true. You'd go to the hospital and they're all fine. You know, all the press, you know, they were looking for the worst things they could find. The article made much in the wake of his uh, rampage yesterday at Dawson College, made much of his love of violent video games, including one that is called Super Columbine Massacre RPG. When I first heard about the news, I went to the bathroom and I threw up. May the next twisted psychopath that you pander to find his way to your family's house, dot, dot, dot. Loved Marilyn Manson. He loved this video game and that video game. And I think Super Columbine Massacre was mentioned there, as well as other video games. I hope prosecutors are able to find something to charge you with after the slaughter in Canada. What they kept bringing up was this video game that he played, Super Columbine Massacre. And I was going, oh my god. It's disgusting. At that time, rumors were flying around that the same guy was going to make a game about Dawson. All kinds of stuff. The media was just blowing it out of proportion. So I basically, I went home completely pissed off and I just wrote this email to Dan. He basically, you know, tell him where he could shove it and what a disgusting video game this was and everything. If you can tell me one valid reason you think your video game should still exist, then please reply. It could have been anyone that got shot. And all I know is that if you don't take your game down, you're just as sick as Gil and the Columbine kids. And I just hope the guy who goes into your school looking for blood doesn't miss you when he shoots. I think I went for a short walk before I replied to that email. And, and the stakes were a lot higher. <laughs> he was actually really nice. Wrote to me, explained everything. I saw on the website there was a statement, you know, saying how he felt about the Dawson shooting, everything like that. So, you know, at the same time you're realizing that it's the media that blows everything out of proportion, basically. They say, well, he was a goth. Let's look at the usual things, you know? and. It's really terrible that that's what our society is like, but when they see that there was a 25-year-old goth who was playing video games and had all these guns, they assume it must be the video games that set him off, rather than looking at all the other things that it could have been. He talks about, oh, Postal 2. I wish I could walk around and shoot people like in Postal 2, yet because the name's not violent, it was the Columbine game they went for, basically. The mass media who have no understanding of video games or don't play video games, they look at video games and relate school violence automatically. It's a given. It's just an easy target. You know, anytime you can blame a video game or praise a video game, right? Anything surprising about video games that they've placed, right now, it's always good press. The game is going to be tested. This is not just an exercise or an experiment, you know, in artistic commentary, and then we get to go home and feel good about being artists. When it actually happens again, we can't just wash our hands. We have to engage those questions and the approaches to them that a game like the Columbine game tried to raise. What time are you up this morning? Jeez, oh, five, I think. What are you doing up so early? 
Oh, I'm, you know, trying to save Western civilization, so. Typically, the school shooters train literally on video games to do this. Dawson College last year, Montreal, uh, the shooter, the killer, trained on a, a game called Super Columbine Massacre. Whether or not Kim Virgil was trained to do what he did, I don't, uh, I, on that particular game, I really don't know. I'm just kind of curious, you're, again, your, your link of Super Columbine to, uh, uh, to Kim Veer. I didn't, I didn't do that. I have what, I have a signing of it. For example, the Montreal Dawson College shooter of last year, he trained on Super Columbine Massacre. Kim Veer Gill was into violent video games, one of which was Postal 2, another one of which was this game. And I, all I said was it raises concerns. Dawson College in Montreal, the perpetrator was found to have trained on Super Columbine Massacre, a video game that glamorized and actually replicated the Columbine Massacre. So that's one thing that the authorities are going to be looking at. Clicking a mouse and, you know, punching some keys on a keyboard in a scaled 2D sort of 3D representation is so far removed from, you know, actually picking up a weapon and using it. And I'll blast my way out with my tail stick right deep tummy bird. You can fire a whole burst of caps or shoot one at a time. The Tommy Burst has automatic bolt action. Fire off a burst of 10 shots. Pull the bolt again, you're reloaded. There's no question that school shooters and others who have done things like this have been immersed in this type of entertainment and it's had a causative effect. Just because something happens before something else doesn't mean that it happens because of something else. So just because somebody played this video game before they went out and shot somebody doesn't mean that that was the cause. It could have just been uh, as, as much that the person was wearing a certain kind of tennis shoes under that logic. So to say, um, oh, this kid played video games and then he went and did a school shooting, I played video games. You play video games. Violent interactive entertainment can not only fuel an appetite to kill or be violent, but also impart skills and techniques and scenarios that the perpetrators would not otherwise have. So if you have appetite to kill on one side of the coin and on the other side, the techniques of killing, violent games can be a murder simulator in, in, in those dual respects. To call a video game a murder simulator uh, is foolish. I've played plenty of SimCity in which you take on the role of a city planner, but I have never personally felt the need to go out and plan a city. Just looking around here, go to any trade show, watch people play games, no one is like, God, I'm murdering someone, I love to murder. No one's doing that, everyone's having fun, we're all laughing. You get together with your friends, you, you sort of essentially have this big game of tag and roughhousing, uh, it's all in good fun, and then you go back to whatever you were doing. I've been a vampire and I've been an armed hedgehog. I don't understand, I just don't get it. I don't think I'm an armed hedgehog. On the battlefields of our Civil War, young men were found on those battlefields with their muskets with eight or nine loads unfired in the guns. The soldiers were unwilling and unable psychologically to pull the trigger and shoot another human being because they were brought up not to do that. And so the video games have been a very effective means in a military setting to get uh, new recruits to do that. Because video games have been used to train hand-eye coordination in soldiers or race car drivers or anything else, does not mean that they have impacted the willingness to cross any kind of moral boundaries. They studied giving passages of the Bible that contain violence to people, and they found out that after reading these, those people were more prone to violence than people who had read more mild scriptural passages. Now, this is the exact same effect that researchers measure with violent movies and violent video games. It happens with the Bible as well. There's no mature rating on the Bible, and maybe that's part of their point, but at least the Bible has context in which violence at any time a visit upon anyone is not portrayed as appropriate. That isn't how I read the Bible. If the Bible and video games make people marginally more aggressive when they contain violent passages, then perhaps uh, this whole argument's a tempest in a teapot, that there is, no, there is no argument there. I think if we were faced with the choice of would you rather have your child read the Bible 15 hours a day or play Grand Theft Auto San Andreas that number of hours every day, most parents would say, well, I'll take my chances with the Bible. If every single game you played was war, 
then I would say maybe there's a problem there. You know, but most kids only, you know, they play war, then they play something else. You know, then they, they play cards. You know, then they make models or whatever it is that they do. There's a balance in that. And I think that's one of the things the game industry has not taken the time to address is balance of choice. As a father of three young boys, 11, 8, and 6, who are avid gamers, I'm very concerned about the content included in the games. And as I stand there watching them play these violent games, <laughs> helpless to do anything about it, I, I can't help but wonder where the system has failed. I'm not saying, and no one in their right mind would say, that every kid is affected in the same fashion and to the same degree to the point of going Columbine in playing violent video games. But when you dump this interactive technology into the universe of kids, you're going to get more violence, more aggression. And on the extreme end of things, you're going to get more murderous violence, I believe, because it's going to push some of these kids to that point. In the boom of video game growth through the mid 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, crime rates were falling. So if you want to talk about correlation, video game sales are going up, crime rates are going down. If there's any correlation, it's that games reduce crime. Now that would be nonsense if I actually tried to make that argument seriously. But I have more evidence to make that argument than the other side. I mean, you've got a few isolated incidents that only are getting pressed by the simple fact that they had something to do with video games. What about all the kids out there who didn't say that it had to do with a video game, who picked up a gun and smoked a few cops? They basically blamed it on the media and everything that was around him rather than blaming it on him. Violent games are literally processed in a different part of the brain than in adult brains. It's the amygdala, the midbrain, that leads to copycatting functions. The brain scan studies at Harvard show that. Any of the so-called science that justifies any kind of change in the brain chemistry or neurotransmitters and so forth have, have been roundly rejected by every court. In state after state, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Washington State, Michigan, Minnesota, and the states put forth this junk science. One after the other, same research. And the courts look at it and say, this is completely unpersuasive. You know, the pioneers always take the arrows. The first uh, uh, cases against big tobacco were unsuccessful, but we're getting there. Please don't equate them with pornography, because they're not. Please don't equate them with smoking, because they're not. And please don't equate them with real world violence, because they're not. They're play. And we should be allowed to explore the same things we can explore in movies and in books, in video games. This notion that you have some maniac who goes and shoots up a whole university campus and video games made him do it, we're ducking responsibility in this country when we make those kinds of arguments. Some people just don't get it. I mean, for, the, for Jack Thompson, he must not be able to enjoy lots of things, I'm assuming. There's a place for violent entertainment, and always has been, because violence is a part of the world. It's a part of the human experience. Games are a reflection, in many ways, of the cultures not only that make them, but play them. I wonder whether there was um, some Viking out there with a big bear skin over his uh, shoulders saying, you can't tell that Beowulf story. They're ripping that ogre's arm socket out and killing dragons. People are dying, kids will get ideas in their heads. They'll slaughter us all. Yeah, you know, I, it, this, this argument has to go back forever. There will eventually be an event so cataclysmic that will eclipse Columbine as to the body count in which the perpetrator was a video gamer, that then you will have a hue and cry for the banning of these games and some of this technology altogether. We ought to look at the underlying problems in this country if we're worried about violence like that and start dealing with those problems instead of going for the politically simplistic solutions of pointing the fingers at a form of entertainment which if you eliminated it tomorrow, wouldn't eliminate crime in this country. Sunday is the anniversary of the Thurston High School shooting. Eight years after the deadly event, community members still question why it happened. A new book, The Shooting Game, attempts to pinpoint what leads to school shootings like the one at Thurston. The only thing that's worked is students informing when they hear something, when they hear about a threat, they realize, I could save my life and the life of my friends by reporting this. The society prepares the crime, the criminal carries it out. These were two kids that could have been anything in the world they wanted to be. They came from privileged homes, good families, they had plenty of money, 
They could have done anything in the world they wanted, and instead they wanted to destroy that world around them. I think there's something really telling about that situation. You know, surprised me in Japan when I got there. This very peaceful society where they have very little crime, almost no murders, the most violent comic books, and the most violent television I'd ever seen. So, I mean, it didn't take an Einstein to figure out that this is a release for a lot of people. Back when Columbine first happened, and they started looking at these kids who had played Doom as the reason why you know, they had gone astray. Just it baffled me both on a personal and professional level because there were so many influences in their lives that were all negative and all you know, combining together. I, I, my, my initial reaction was where the hell are the parents? They're making bombs in their bedroom and their parents aren't aware of it. The police didn't really do a whole lot, so I think that had a big part of it. I think if they would have investigated them a little bit more, they would have found, you know, all their stuff and all their plans and like, hey, you know, you can't be doing this and, you know, you have to go off to, you know, go to jail for a while or whatever, you know. They never said, oh, hey, this is because we played Doom 2 way too much. They talked about, you know, if only our parents had been there for us, if only people had asked, you know, questions how we were feeling. Same thing with Kim Virgil. He locked himself in his basement. Nobody checked if he was all right and yet they're gonna blame it on video games rather than the fact that nobody reached out to actually help them. You can't blame the games. All you can say is, in the wrong hands, it's a contributing factor. The game becomes an easy out for society, an easy out for the teachers, an easy out for the police or the parents, uh, you know, everyone, the politicians involved. Whenever something isn't going well in national politics or international politics or the war, what have you, then all of a sudden we've got this huge problem with video game violence, or we got you know, rap music that we got to eliminate. Uh, it's you know hide hide the ball and look at the monkey, and you know let's pass a flag burning amendment when we don't want to be talking about what's going on in Iraq. The goal here is not to be politically fashionable. The goal here is to make sure that we protect our children. We know that children who are in their formative years are shaped by external factors. We know by every study that violent behavior is learned. Well, if it's learned, the implication is that it's taught. A lot of them said that in high school he was always the sweet, quiet one. You know, he was completely normal, nobody understood what happened to him. And then in the last few months they saw a sudden change. And my question is, when they saw that sudden change, why did they turn away? When a lot of people ask the question, why did they do it? Why did Eric and Dylan shoot up their school? They don't actually want the answer. He's saying, here's a classification, we're martyrs. Not every school shooter, but this group of school shooters is martyrs. What's the last thing they do in Al-Qaeda before they go blow up something? They make a video of themselves and they send it to the media. Well, Al Jazeera is the one that's going to play it, not NBC News. Once again, the tie-in to the Middle Eastern suicidal terrorists. They want to be killed. They're suicidal. They're not trying to survive but they don't want to go out as a lonely, isolated person in some back room. They want to go out with that big four-letter word, F-A-M-E. It's not American Idol, but they will be on TV. If you die and enough people are watching, then you become a martyr, you become a hero, you become well-known. So when you have things like Columbine and you have these kids that are angry and they have something to say and no one's listening, the media sends a message that if you do something loud enough and it gets our attention, then you will be famous for it. Those kids ended up on the cover of Time magazine. The media gave them exactly what they wanted. and That's why I never did any interviews when that happened, when I was getting blamed for it, because I felt that I would be contributing to what I found to be uh, reprehensible. There's uh, an American congressman named Tom DeLay who uh, wanted and actually had written in the congressional record after Columbine that part of the reason the shooting occurred is because the schools were teaching evolution. SUVs can kill, baseball bats can kill, knives and ropes can kill. They've been used for murder, but they weren't made for murder. Guns were made to kill. You can use a gun to go hunting, to protect your family, or to commit mass murder. It's up to you. I went on the website for the gun that he used, the semi-automatic, you know, shoots extremely fast, and the I was disgusted because the caption on the website basically said you have this huge automatic rifle and it, the little caption says, for home protection and home security. The mainstream media schools were allowed to have one reaction to the Columbine massacre, and that is, what a terrible tragedy. These were terrible kids. They listened to Marilyn Manson and they went and killed people. If you have any other point of view on that massacre than that, you're wrong. you must love 
the killing of children. And I mean, that's the culture we're in right now. It's, it's stupid, it's, it's I, I don't know, it's a product of our, our just ridiculous mainstream media rules where you're allowed to have two perspectives, there's black and there's white. You either love murder or you accept the canned mainstream media version of any story that comes down the pike. So I got an email once from someone claiming to go to Columbine High School right now. I'm just writing to let you know that a lot of the things that Eric and Dylan went through are still going on at Columbine. And he said that it wouldn't surprise him if there was another school shooting at Columbine High School. If you just throw up your hands and say, we can't explain it, the only way we can explain it is that these two kids were just evil. Then that doesn't help because you're going to have someone else who you're going to label as evil come along and do the same thing again. The problems that the game was, was, was trying to tackle aren't going to go away. So if this is truly an example of a piece of art that leads us to explore and maybe draw conclusions about this kind of human behavior, uh, then it's not going to be something that's relevant just once when the press finds it convenient, but rather again and again as, as we, we find reasons, good or bad, to, to come back to these topics and engage them. So this is our memorial wall. We sort of set it up when we redid the office this Christmas break. We basically put every page of the memorial issue on the wall. And uh, the memorial issue was our issue that came out right after the shooting. The whole thing where everybody was so much more compassionate right after the shooting to each other and then that just faded. Why did it have to fade? Why can't people actually genuinely care about each other and care what's going on in other people's lives? I'd watch Bowling for Columbine and go, wow, that's kind of scary, you know? That'll never happen to me. And then when it actually happens to you, you see a guy pulling out guns in a school, all of a sudden you realize that it can happen anywhere. So people, you need to stop forgetting that things like this, you know, happen. Think about them and think about what you're gonna do to stop them from happening. I work as a youth mentor in my community, and one of the things I do is give kids an opportunity to express themselves creatively, which is really what saved me. From, from Columbine in, in a personal sense. I found other ways, and some of the films I made are really fucking angsty, you know, but it was, it was important for me to get through that. I'm into websites, web design and stuff like that, so I figured it would be really easy to make an online community, kind of like MySpace or something, which would basically be people sign up and they can either help each other or help themselves. Something like Kill Thinking never would have worked if I didn't have the publicity of being a school shooting survivor. I don't want people to remember me as someone who got shot. I want me to be remembered as someone who got shot and then did something about it and tried to make a difference. All those off his album Nova's Lounge, released by Nova Records a couple of years ago now. Uh, I think I'm the only DJ that plays that one, but I'm pretty into it, so from time to time I have to give it a, I have to give it a go. When I went to the CUP conference, I saw the video game politics one, and I was just looking at it a little interested, and then I saw that it was by Danny. So I was like, I want to go to this, and I want to see what he's going to say. I guess I didn't understand the game, and I was very biased at that point. And there was one point in the presentation where Danny started to personalize it, where he actually explained why he felt he had to make this game. I guess it was when he said that... To be honest with you, I was headed down something of a similar path. I think, as the two killers. To some people that might be like, oh wow, he is sick or something like that. But to me it was more like he, his eyes were opened to him. He actually realized something and it actually changed him. I mean, obviously we can't have a shooting happen every day for people to realize these things. But if there's another way, such as this game, to help people realize some things that are maybe wrong in their life, then I think we, need, we have a place for those games in our society. Some people go through it and it makes them think twice about the idea that they would even contemplate doing something like this in real life. I mean, if I hadn't found that game, probably I would have already planted a bomb in the school or, or killed somebody or basically screwed up my life without it because, which, because without it, I wouldn't have had a chance to examine what's going on around me, what's how I'm feeling on the inside or anything like that. What Danny was attempting to do was, uh, in some ways, PhD thesis on the shooting because there's so many, so many facts and so much information involved about those students, the students who committed the act, their, their lives. This was a philosopher. This was somebody who wasn't just out to make people feel bad. You know, I've read his quote-unquote artistic statement 
and uh, it reminded me of the ramblings of Cho, the gunman at Virginia Tech, and his little videotape message. You can compare him to the fellow that did the game about the Virginia Tech shooting, who was a complete ass. I wouldn't mind some money because I'm broke. <laughs> this guy obviously either wanted just attention or a little money if he could. Danny wasn't about that. He didn't want the attention. He didn't even want people to know who he was. And he certainly didn't want money. He offered it free. He really did this because I think he has a concern for why does this happen. I think only someone who is uh, extremely narcissistic would believe that what they have done by this game is a good thing, that they have created a dialogue on the tragedy. Danny was a counterbalance to a lot of the other things that were going into the book. And to have him writing, I thought was a kind of a way to bring in a voice of a generation. He would be what I would consider smart at school and dumb on the bus. If he cannot understand the impact he's having on families, on the public, um, by, by, by putting this out there, I think it's tragic. He does have to think about what the repercussions are if he makes this piece and someone goes and does what happened at Dawson or Virginia Tech or wherever. We'd spent several hours sitting and talking about the events of that day and that tragedy. The game itself may not have included all of that discussion, but it provoked it. Well, there's probably other ways to do it, maybe better ways, but the way he did it definitely caught the attention of people like gamers who are not part of other discussions. If his intention was to start a dialogue, he started it, stop the game. Uh, you can stop now. His intent is irrelevant next to your experience of the game because, of course, he could be wrong about his intent for the game, or he could be unaware of various important ways that the culture has written him, especially as a resident of the state that he is a resident of. You know, I, I understand that he was in the general area, the, the geographic area of Denver or Colum, you know, when, when he was there, and, and this is perhaps his way of living out the experience of what he went through. You know what? Put the game down and go to therapy. A lot of that argument that he's just in it for this reason or that reason is about projection. It's about what people want this to be about, rather than about what it is about, which is about the very tangled social, psychological, and moral issues that still are with us from Columbine. And I knew about Slam Dance as a festival, but I didn't know they had a game competition. It seems like it would be a waste of my time and money to submit this game, because they're <laughs> gonna look at this, they'll see the title, and they'll throw it in the trash can, and that'll be, that'll be it. And that was pretty much how I, I felt on the subject until I got an email from Sam Roberts. Every once in a while somebody would say, you put the Columbine Massacre RPG in? And I said, you know what, you should play that game. I think it has some interesting things to say about what games should be doing, and more importantly, I think it has interesting things to say about that event in American history and how we should address things like that. And people would say, well, okay, you know, that's a little edgy, but I get it. We get a lot of anonymous email, we got anonymous phone calls, um, people saying, you shouldn't be doing this, this is wrong. I recognize intolerance, sort of thing I let roll off my back. I apologized to everyone in the office that they had to deal with it and told them to just root everything to me, that I was ready to take it. I said, you know, of course I don't want kids to see the game, I'm going to have to call Danny and make sure he's fine with being in a mature audience's only screening. And then two days later, Peter came into the office and sat everyone in the office down and said, this isn't open to discussion. This is a decision that's been made. We're removing the game from the competition. The game was a finalist in the Slam Dance Guerrilla Game Maker competition until the festival's president, Peter Baxter, pulled the game from the competition to avoid potential lawsuits. Slam Dance says, quote, there are moral obligations to consider with this particular game and the preservation of the Slam Dance organization and its whole community, end quote. I reviewed it, discovered that in fact it was potentially the most important artistic video game ever created, <laughs> I would say. So then I understood fully why the judges had picked it. And then it's pulled. I actually said aloud, wow, this is a really big deal. I actually thought that it was a joke. You know, no one called any of the sponsors, no one called any of the judges, no one... How could that happen? I spoke with Peter Baxter uh, right after the announcement was made, and um, I spoke with him probably for 30 or 40 minutes, and 90% and of that phone call was me trying to get him to answer that question, or, or right. answer the question, why? There's an old saying in journalism, which is, it's not the act that gets you in trouble, but it's the cover-up that always gets you in trouble. I personally talked to Peter Baxter three times over the course of the festival, uh, 
And I have to say that was probably the least valuable research that I did because Peter Baxter still to this day will not say why he pulled the gang. He'll give you vague answers that, you know, are the hallmarks of someone who is covering up what his real reasons are. The exposure, um, legal exposure, that after speaking to two of our lawyers and they felt this would you know, bring up if we showed the game publicly at Sundance. And I was told in no uncertain terms that it would not be beneficial to slam dance. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, have they cleared their music? You know, do they have a right to show the picture? Is there an argument amongst the filmmaker or the game maker in actually being able to bring it to Park City? Danny and I discussed the clearance issues and actually checked them against Slam Dance's clearance policies and things like that in the past. And Danny basically fit in under the wire, under fair use and documentary, but it was tight. But I didn't think it would be a big deal. And then because the game was a controversy... This happens all the time. Most of the films you're going to see in a film festival <laughs> have clearance issues. The only reason that someone in Peter's position brings up a clearance issue is because they're using it as cover because they're pulling it for some other reason. It, it wasn't a case of Sundance being afraid of winning or losing a civil law action. It was just the basic ability of actually, can we undertake round one of going through the process of that? In this country, anybody can sue anybody for anything. You file a lawsuit, it costs you a couple hundred bucks, filing fee, you can scribble it out on a napkin and suddenly you're sued. I know from having run a festival and having made films that have been in festivals, including in slam dance, there's, there are always clearance issues. Just for one example, I made a film in 2002 called Nothing So Strange. Nothing So Strange was about the assassination of Bill Gates. It was a mockumentary, a genre that's normally considered a comedy genre, and slam dance premiered that film. Bill Gates himself said he thought the film threatened the safety of himself, his wife, and his children. The press confronted Peter Baxter and said, are you going to pull this film? And Peter Baxter said, no, absolutely not. We stand by it 100%. So if anybody here is questioning whether Danny's game was treated as a second-class citizen, I can tell you, yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, we made Waco Resurrection, a 3D um, game that reimagined uh, David Koresh returning from heaven to defend his people, the Davidians, against the onslaught of the FBI and the ATF. I don't think Waco is as controversial as Super Columbine, but also it was the first year and I think that Slam Dance got on the map for games, particularly. Should Super Columbine Massacre RPG have been pulled from Slam Dance? Well, according to you, 58% of you said it should not have been pulled. After it was decided that it should be in the competition, I mean, we wouldn't want that to happen to us. Nobody wants it to happen. That was the, that was the initial reaction. We're like, well, what do we do about this? Um, we wrote a letter. The open letter was basically a lot of the developers expressing their opinion that they felt that you know, Super Columbine Massacre shouldn't have been pulled from the competition. Uh, you know, asking for it to be brought back in. What can we do to avoid this, right, to, to stop this? And at the time, the only thing we can do is to, to pull the game, to, pro to protest. Now, almost half the competition's 14 finalists have withdrawn their entries. They call Slam Dance's move an insult to their media. We need venues like the Slam Dance Game Festival to promote these kind of efforts. So it, to see one of these festivals start to fall apart, was dismaying. When the festival refused to acknowledge the feelings of more than half of the finalists, we felt we could not, in good conscience, uh, be involved anymore. She said that she was going to pull um, the, the sponsorship because uh, of the artistic intentions that, they, that, we, that she thought we had, but indeed we no longer had. First of all, it's a business relationship. It's very different than, than the relationship of a finalist. So for example, when the Flow team made their decision, they very clearly made it on moral grounds. This pooling is such a strong signal that sends out to the entire world, that especially to independent game makers, that you cannot make game like this. There was never any except, you know, this kind of game or only this kind of game will be in the festival. There's never any qualifications. So I respect Trace's views. There are other game makers here that would have enjoyed the prize that was being offered by USC, and they may not share Trace's views. It's got to a point where there was a lot of knocking of heads and not a lot of, whoa, what's going on here and how can we make this the best for everyone involved. It was an incredible feeling to have a school like USC behind you on a decision like this, especially when USC is not typically seen as a school to, to make these kind of stands. Supporting people who are trying to make the first baby steps into games as an expressive medium is important to us. And standing by that type of experimental work 
seemed to us an important teaching moment. I still wouldn't say it was the right decision on their part, but it certainly opened up avenues of discussion where hopefully we can make things better in the future. It was just too much drama for me, you know, like, I just like making video games. That's, that's you know, that's all it is. We're really glad that we came. Um, it's, it's been great to see all the other game designers. It's been great to meet the Slam Dance staff, and we've talked a lot about it. Before I started watching films, I met Danny, who was there in the games room. Then Danny let me play the game on his computer, and uh, more importantly, I watched somebody else play the game and got to see their experience of playing the game. Okay, so I go to my fellow jurors, we, we research the issue six ways from Sunday, we play the game, and we all come to the conclusion, you know what? A special jury prize is what this game deserves from the documentary jury. It's a special piece of work. It is a fusion of gameplay and documentary filmmaking. It was wronged by Slam Dance, and as a Slam Dance jury, we can kind of make up for that by forcing Slam Dance to give this game a prize. And they were fucking furious. They, 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 at first they were flabbing, they said, what, you can't do that. I said, oh no, actually we can. We're the jury, we're giving a special jury prize. You know, and, uh, and we're going to be announcing that on the stage tonight. So I suggest that you not make a big deal out of this and you let us do this. A little after nine o'clock, we're ready to go up on stage and announce who the documentary jury was going to give the awards to. And Peter Baxter saw us, he made a beeline for us, and he just started screaming. He just, he, he could not have been, you can't imagine a man more angry than this. And he was yelling at me, he was saying, you don't know what happened behind the scenes. I'm saying, Peter, I've asked you, why don't you just tell me? He's like, well, it's complicated. It's, it's complicated and you should have come to, to me separately. We could have worked something out, which is bullshit. Well, you know, we wouldn't have worked anything out at all. He's embarrassed about the decision he made and he doesn't want to acknowledge the mistake that he's made. He doesn't want to be called to account for the decision that he made. So on the spot, I resigned from the documentary jury. I said, all right, if you guys want to go up there and give the awards without this one, you go ahead, but I'm not going to. They went and announced the awards without giving Columbine Massacre a special jury prize, and I had to call up Danny Ladoni and say, oh, by the way, that prize you were going to get, you're not getting there. That's how Super Columbine Massacre still has not <laughs> had the wrong against it right in my slam. We support what the programmers and the jury do, but in this case, we couldn't. And every now and again at Slam Dance, we do have to, uh, in the end, pull, pull something. It's sort of unprecedented, you know, that there haven't been many instances that I can think of where Slam Dance has pulled something after it's been announced. You know, that's the key. A panel of judges who re reviewed all the games, who decided that Flow should go, and decided many other games should go, also decided that this project should go. So it did not seem really fair that one person could then unilater unilaterally say, this has gone too far now. Yeah, and he is not even part of the gaming community. He, is, he does not represent, you know, the other judges. He does not represent right. anyone. If you're trying to decide that we want to be alternative, the, the ultimate risk may be someday we have to close the doors. With my site, I kind of have to deal with a lot of stuff with controversial content, and you know, we lose advertisers a lot, and we kind of deal with that. We actually, we actually lose the advertisers instead of trying to censor the content. It just, I think, said a lot about the direction that the Slam Dance Festival was going, that it was becoming more institutionalized. They wanted to be able to support this idea of independent games. They knew that if they were going to have this festival, that basically this game had to be in there but they didn't have the conviction to sort of follow it through. And I don't think that it was a case of that they were pressured. I just think that, again, they were ambivalent. They didn't really know themselves that this was something they wanted to stand behind. And so they pulled it to be safe. The only reason you could possibly say that it's good that Super Columbine got pulled is a cynical reason, and that's for press. We're not that smart. <laughs> I wish we were that smart. Sam, we're not that smart, are we? No. No, but if anyone asks if the entire thing was a coordinated publicity stunt by all of us, just say no comment. Once you take that away once, then what's stopping you from taking it away again and again and again? And so the, in, in many ways, the entire value of the festival is destroyed the moment that a decision like this is made. What you're dealing with there is the, the well-known chilling effect on protected speech. What Peter Baxter is most guilty of is being a strong proponent of a chilling effect with regard to video games. And I think it's a mistake just to look at Slam Dance and say, yeah, they got in the way of freedom of expression. They tried to alter my art and change their minds. They weren't courageous enough to show it. 
It's not, it's, not as, it's not as simple as that. Why should Slam Dance exist if what it's going to do when it holds its guerrilla game maker competition pull out anything remotely guerrilla? This is the question we ask ourselves, not just about the game competition, but we've asked ourselves every year about Slam Dance itself. Like, is there still a need for us to exist? Is there still a need for us to exist in, in Park City? Maybe we need to not have the games competition as a part of the film festival in Park City, Utah, if we can't fight that fire. If the competition isn't as risky as the film competition, then what is it? Taking into account Cloud, which was at Slam Dance last year, the game asked of you to affect the natural environment in which you're playing, which is around you. As a result of that, you learn to how to positively create a better natural environment. So while one is constructive, one is destructive. How does that really affect us? Games that critique a society in which violence is an issue may need to use violence as one of their pieces of language. It's just like when poetry is invented. Plato thinks that poetry makes human beings feel emotional and dangerous. You know, they, they can't control their emotion. And they, you know, maybe Peter Baxter is the Plato. It's wonderful that Peter likes Cloud, but it's easy to like Cloud. Cloud is a game that many people can connect to even those who don't play games. And that was a wonderful design goal for that particular game, but it can't be the design goal for every game. You can't just say, we're going to support independent games that are pretty and nice and beautiful. We also will need to support independent games that are provocative and difficult and critique our society. My personal view as a designer is that I always want that reaction, that emotion, to be positive. But of course, I understand that other designers work with other visions, other emotions, sometimes fear, or horror, or revenge, or violence, and that's fine. There is no right or wrong in what feelings are triggered. All that's important is the final result that you want the player to experience. In these kinds of games, there's so much interactiveness, and that's what the, the fear level comes up. I mean, you watch a film, you read a book, you're trying to be more educated about something. Here you're actually playing, you're conducting the murders yourself. Games are different to film. The, their, their influence in terms of the ability to role play is completely different. You know, in a movie you're watching, in a video game you're actually doing the shooting. You're leaning forward and you're participating in the act of violence. You can repeat the acts of violence over and over and over again. In my mind, Games, music, and movie are all part of the broader entertainment diet, and really there should be no distinction between one from the other. You know, you go to a movie and it's an event, you sit down, you watch it, you get something out of it. Um, a video game is just something to numb your mind for a little while. Why is it permitted for Michael Moore in 2002 to make Bowling for Columbine a film essay on this subject and to use far more graphic footage than Daniel Ladoni does three years later in a primitive low-res video game. So a documentary is acceptable, but, the but video a video game is not. not. Right. And so you're either making a and judgment think, about games... I think it basically comes into the point where you're playing the character. The real issue is to what degree does it engage the participant, whether it's you know, the viewer, the reader, the listener, or the, the player. Games are really good at engaging the player. And one of the tools it uses is the interactivity. Sure. There's research now to show that interactive entertainment has a higher impact as behavior modifying than more passively consumed entertainment. When someone plays or, or is at play, whether it's a video game, a board game, a role-playing game, cops and rock, you know, whatever, is at play, there's this kind of unwritten rules that, that you are entering this magic circle and within that circle you are governed by the rules of the game. It means that, you know, this is a gun, or if I say, you know, if I were playing cops and robbers, if I say you're dead, well, you have to fall over. As a person, when you step into that magic circle, it is a conscious decision. All games have this sort of associative psychology at play. So you identify with the character or with whatever form of, of influence you have, even if it's like Tetris and it's pretty abstract. The question really comes, where does the authorship of the designer end and where does the authorship of the player begin? Typically agencies associated with fun and so you're the character doing crazy stuff, you're associating with the character, you're having fun. but. This game was doing something new to that. It was it was like a dissociation. You're playing it and you're, and you're trying to win, you're leveling up and shit, and then you're like, 
wait a minute, I just murdered a, like a girl, dude. Like, that's not right. This made me think about what they were, like really sort of explore what they and were I doing in the, a way that they don't. And the, so in that sense, it almost trivializes it less. Are we really going to say that video game designers are the one set of artists that do not have the right to engage in contemporary political issues because we don't trust their audience. The impulse that drives people to make video games is the same one that drove people to create drama thousands of years ago or to invent the novel. The big advantage you have over film or over books, I mean, if you think of Lolita, and I'm not saying this is Lolita, but that book was actually banned and it was very hard to get, right? Ulysses was hard to get. People couldn't get it. People weren't getting 90,000 of them for free. Danny Ladoni has referred to Columbine itself as a canary in a coal mine, but it's the game as well as a canary in a coal mine for what awaits the gaming industry in the next decades if it is ignorant of the history of film. One of the things that united the content control advocates of the 19 aughts through the 1930s was the belief that there were certain things that were inherently unrepresentable by film. Gangsters being one of them. Um, and we've seen how that's turned out. People are just going to talk about games. They're going to talk about what games they like, what kinds of things games made them feel. They're going to talk about a moment that they had in a game that changed their life. And that's already happened for a lot of people. But at some point in the very near future, those are the kinds of discussions and the way we're going to be talking about games. And we're not going to be asking this question anymore. Maybe the game just isn't good enough to really represent that particular tragic event in the way that people are willing to accept. I would believe that if any more than 10% of the press that reviewed this game had played it. Only one reporter had looked or played the game. One was going to. Two showed slightest amount of embarrassment by not looking at it. And the rest really didn't care. Would a journalist ever review even the most controversial film without having seen the film. You know, if someone were to write an article about Columbine or a book about Columbine or do a documentary about Columbine, it would inherently be treated with some measure of respect, and at least until someone had looked at it and decided it was horrendous and evil. Uh, but kind of out of the, the gate, people assumed that uh, the Super Columbine game was horrendous and evil without bothering to take a look at it. But even if they had played the game, I don't think they, they, would have, they would have come to the same conclusions. They didn't have the body of references, they didn't come up uh, playing games, they didn't take games seriously enough to think this could be anything more than a, just a really bad joke. We don't ask journalists to be specialists. In fact, journalism practice has been historically to rotate people through various beats. We want them to be generalists. It's not a good story unless it either has a hero or a villain, so which do they want to paint you as? It just has all the makings of spectacle. So it's particularly important, I think, with those kinds of artifacts that we do, we do this critical work. If uh, a college professor wants to laud that person for doing that type of thing, then I think, um, I think that's a statement on the professor. I think that's important for all games because the only entry points we have now are, is this fun, or you know, how rapidly can I get through the level, or um, how easy is it for me to figure out how to play. But it's particularly important for a game like Columbine, which is at risk of not even being played at all. I wrote an article on the game, and I remember when I was telling people that I was writing the article, a lot of people were telling me, why would you do that, that's awful. And all I would say to them is, well, read my article when it comes out. <laughs> you should be disturbed by this game. Uh, you should be disturbed by the Columbine Massacre. You should be disturbed by the media's reaction to the Columbine Massacre. You should be disturbed when you play the game and you discover there were things you didn't know about Columbine that you're finding out through a fucking video game you know, that, that's pixelated and you know, looks like garbage. You, know? you should be concerned that this is how you found out. You didn't find out you know, on your high definition television watching you know, Fox News or CNN. The students put together a committee of people they'd like to see come to campus, and Danny's name was on the list. I'd never heard of him. I was not that in tune with what was going on with his game. And it was actually well before um, the whole Slam Dance controversy where we started talking to Danny about him coming. When Slam Dance happened, all of a sudden Danny's like, okay, well now we definitely have your First Amendment connection. I'm disturbed by the, the idea of the Columbine game in general. I, I, it, it scares me. But... I know that you can't stop people from getting it, and it, it bothers me even more that somebody would decide that you can't distribute such a thing. I prefer that the government not be involved uh, at any level, state, local, federal, um, in rating video games or enforcing laws. I'm, I'm, at, 
heart uh, a recovering libertarian. I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a small government guy. I'm a Republican. We're talking about the sale of adult material to children. Right. Well, we're, still, we're talking about that now, but you're talking about children. Oh, we've got to protect the children. This is yeah, the well, mantra of every group children? that wants to take away every freedom. It's a classic conflict. That, that is going on here. Mm -hmm. It's the advocates of liberty versus the advocates of coercion, the advocates of we know what's best. Just because there's some crazy kids you out there. Met him in jail, you haven't sat with them in jail cells or sat yeah, with the There have always been Lebanon. crazy kids. There I'll tell you what, have. if you want to talk over me, you do your own show. You know, Jack, okay? you, you interview I'm yourself. Trying to, I'm trying to break in because you won't pause. Did you, just, did you just hang up, Jack? Yeah. Jack Thompson was the first person to ever hang up on, on Free Talk Live. Right. Uh, he, he got, got so, so upset. frustrated and so upset that he actually hung up the phone. Games and gamers have been under the microscope now for far too long. We've allowed politicians and anti-games activists to be the ones to do the speaking for us. They all know that I'm dangerous. They all know that I have some truth here about the recklessness of their industry. And so it's very easy for them to try to marginalize me and say that I'm a, a joke. If I were, they wouldn't be talking about me and they wouldn't be filing lawsuits against me. They would ignore me. It's time that gamers get together. It's time that we, instead of just going on message boards and decrying politicians and anti-gamers activists, it's time that we got together and changed things. People like Penny Arcade and uh, Kataku, however you want to pronounce that, and game politics and so forth, have posted on their blogs uh, advocacy of killing me. You know, I haven't threatened anybody with a physical harm. And so one of the great um, hypocrisies of this industry and its lemmings who people some of these sites is the extent to which I've been targeted for uh, death threats. Uh, Take-Two says at their own website that I'm a bisexual pedophile. I've had sex aid products sent to my wife at our home. And yet these people go into courtrooms and say that freedom of expression is a wonderful thing and that uh, the First Amendment should be for everyone and so forth, fine. Except their position is when it comes to Jack Thompson. But as a Christian, uh, which I am, I, I believe all of this is preordained and, and under God's grace and His sovereignty. And so I'm sitting here talking to you about this because this is part of a plan for my life. Personally, I might find that concept obscene. I find but the it difference crazy. between the difference between me and people like Jack Thompson is that I don't want to enforce my belief system on Jack. I don't want to enforce my belief system on the religious people. I don't want to enforce my belief system on other atheists. I, I don't care what you do with your life. And if you don't like what I have to say, turn off the channel. Go somewhere else. Plug your ears. Walk away. Get off of my property. You know what? Lock it off your computer. Block the site. We can censor ourselves. We don't need to censor each other. So I think that the proper balance is in this legislation that would merely seek to properly label video games so that a parent could look at the video game and know. We ought to be very careful in this country about um, the alternative to voluntary enforcement, which is government mandated control over what people can buy. Minors have constitutional rights as well. When you start violating the First Amendment rights of adults in the name of protecting children, you eliminate the First Amendment rights that they will soon inherit when they become adults. These people are not going to be children forever, and we don't want to protect them so much that by the time they get to be 18, they have no rights left. There was one court case in which a judge ruled that video games are not a form of artistic expression. They said that there is no, there is no communication, there's no art there's no information coming out of a video game, which is kind of foolish because a video game is at least part movie. If you just look at it as a linear series of image of moving images appearing on a screen, it's at least as much of an art form as a movie. When a medium is new, often it's easy to point fingers and say it's different, and therefore we won't accord to it the same level of protection. But that answer is uh, quickly I think, becoming outdated. I just sat some, a kid in the class, in my classroom, up at the game, and I said, play it. And so they did, and the whole class is sitting around, and the next thing that you know that happens is everyone's cheering Eric and Dylan on. And so I let that go on for a second, and then I stopped and I said, look at yourselves. I mean, look at what you're doing. The one long cutscene in the, in the game, it's not of the people that you've killed. It's of the sorrow, it's of the grief, 
It's of the results of your actions. And it's at that point you realize that you have just been made complicit in the whole game. The games use the framework of like a traditional old school Japanese role playing game to sort of lure you in, get you to kill all these students, to get you kind of into a game mode, and then throws you right out of that. And at that point you realize that you're guilty. My students were very uncomfortable when they realized that they were cheering Eric and Dylan on and they had a difficult time with the usual, you know, rant that it's just a game. If this game is not entertaining, if this game is, does not enable that kind of, uh, of entertainment, that's one of its great merits. It makes you feel awful at every moment as you go through this reenactment. And not just awful for doing it, but awful for what the whole situation was and had become. It's the kind of topic that nobody thought a game could tackle, except, you know, somebody had to do it. One of my favorite films that I saw in college that really blew me away was called uh, Superstar. And it's a film by Todd Haynes about the life of Karen Carpenter, who is a pop singer, and she died of anorexia. And Todd Haynes made the entire film with Barbie dolls. Even now, the film is, is more discussed for its medium than its message, that instead of looking at the issues that Todd Haynes raises about femininity or about control and a patriarchal society, the discussion is often around, is it legitimate to use Barbie dolls to portray the life of a pop star who dies of anorexia? It seems to me that Super Columbine is trying to explore this idea of video games as representation, that is, the Columbine killers were pegged as Doom players, and Doom was, you know, summarily, you know, taken to the mat for representations of violence. And what Columbine is doing is representing these kids who are supposedly victims of representation. A typical Japanese role-playing game wouldn't have photos, however poorly digitized, of its weaponry. That's juxtaposing the real world intruding into this what is typically a very fantastic sort of cartoonish world. The graphical realism of violence isn't what makes it so shocking. It's how it's treated, it's how the subject is treated. The game kind of encourages you to get into this state where it's just like, well, there's just another murder. I just, okay, I killed this room full of people. You know, now what? What is the point of all this? Why would I be doing this? That moment where they did question themselves and question the role of video games was a productive moment and that that was a good thing. Americans escape into their television sets, into their films, into their music, and into their video games, and into their computer monitors more than they do any other thing other than work or sleep. I submit to you the question of why it is we continually need to escape and why we need to escape so frequently and for so long. And whether maybe escaping like that is not the best solution to the things that make you need to escape in the first place. I, I, I got to tell you, again, I, I, I think it's, it's disgusting. It's a horrible, horrible thing for the families or anyone involved in Columbine for this person to be exploiting Dot the way that he is. Video games, like these other mediums, can be used to confront topics that are uncomfortable. But Danny, it's a, it's a massacre, and you're revisiting that in a very similar way to, you know, what happened. Doesn't that seem to be very macabre? In contemporary culture, we're afraid to talk about things that are uncomfortable and disturbing. With a lot of people, it's like they don't want to deal with the tough issues. They just rather watch American Idol or whatever else is on, you know. And my opinion is that we should discuss the issues that are hard to discuss. When uh, we started to see movies start to crop up, right, about 9-11, about there was, uh, you know, certain discomfort. Not plain, you know, kind of objection, but discomfort. Are we ready for this kind of film? These are questions that people ask. People in, you know, the Northeast in this part of the country where almost all of us knew at least one, sometimes several people who died as a result. Many people were offended that the movies came out at all, that it was just too soon. But I understand that most of the rest of the country didn't. So I think it's a very personal thing. I'm thinking of Clockwork Orange right now, which is actually a film I really enjoy, but obviously not for the fact that he rapes and murders women, but it's the fact that I'm learning about this character who would do such things and trying to understand how he got to this place. Playing Super Columbine Massacre was more understanding how they got to this place and why they would be in that state of mind to think that these things were okay. So the game, in my view, was created to offend people. 
there is a very broad swath of society that this game is designed to piss off. There's just no question. It's actually part of the success of the game as a work of art that you do feel bad and that you feel so bad that you want to do political speech against it. To me, condemnation is validation. It means that you've done something that challenged somebody so much that they had to condemn you just for saying it. This is a revolution, damn it! We're going to have to offend somebody! It's America. You don't, have, you a don't right. have the right not to be offended. I'm sorry. You don't have the right not to be offended. Get freaking offended. I don't care. When do we stop accusing a particular subject of being ridiculous or valid? Well, what is valid? Do, should, should we make a list of all of the topics that are okay, and then we can pick from it? The question is, can you take real-life tragedies and somehow turn them into educational games? I, you know, I'm sure it's possible. I think it's difficult. Obviously, for people whose view of games is Sonic the Hedgehog, this may come as a novel concept. And it, it's certainly true that most of what the games industry publishes is essentially fluff. The very notion that we would want to question the validity of a piece of art um, simply because it's, it takes something, anything, as its subject, um, is disturbing and should, should really bother us. Nothing is off limits. This isn't a responsible treatment of the event. But I don't think it was an intent, intended to be a responsible treatment. I think it was supposed to be a firebrand sort of thing and it achieved that. But it's not Schindler's List and it's not even Elephant. I completely disagree and I'm not alone. I mean, there was even an interview with one of the survivors from Columbine on Kotaku talking about how cathartic the playing of the game was and how he really was happy that the message was getting out. And so there are contradictory views. I wanted to make a story that, that told from their perspective what happened. Now to some people that means that I'm condoning what they did, or to some people that means that it's a trivialization of the events. I had like a little bit of a similar experience with making 9-11 Survivor, and it was that was something that dealed with like the World Trade Center events. And so when it was thinking about that, it was thinking about, okay, what am I like whose perspective am I dramatizing here? Are you cra like is it a game about crashing planes into the World Trade Center is about what do you do when you're the guy stuck in the office and it's burning down around you. I actually, I got into a conversation with Tracy about this because I was at the World Trade Center when that happened on September 11, 2001, and I found your game completely offensive and, um, and hated it it's a lot. You're free to hate it, too. I mean, I totally thought you treated it in a completely insensitive, terrible way. When I saw your game, I gave a deep sigh of relief in the idea that, that I was not the only one that was interested in looking at a serious topic. If we're not going to explore the more serious aspects of gameplay, the more provocative or difficult aspects of, of gameplay, then we're losing a great potential. The game consists in taking the command of this task force of silenciators che hanno il compito di dissuadere, di consolidare l'omertà all'interno delle istituzioni ecclesiastiche, quindi all'interno di oratori, di chiese, di scuole cattoliche, diciamo così intimidire i testimoni di abusi sessuali in modo che questi testimoni non chiamino la polizia, non, 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 pro, non provochino la cattura dei, dei preti colpevoli di questi crimini. Non provocatori nel senso di provocazione gratuita, non era una, una ricerca di attenzione mediatica eh, così tanto per fare. L'idea era quella di provocare pensieri, discussioni, anche dibattiti. And an online organization gets young people to videotape themselves denouncing and denying God. We're going to tell you why. You know, negative press needs to be your goal. You need to imagine, okay, what negative press am I going to get? And how will I make that into a good thing? I'm really worried about this. I'm really worried about you. This thing made me sick. I wish people go on and take a look at it. They wouldn't believe what you're doing here. You're not at Harvard having a, you know, a structured, formal debate about a philosophical issue. Fox News is a knife fight. CNN is a knife fight with slightly smaller knives, you know? And really, I think once you start thinking that way, you quickly realize that the alternative to desiring negative press is desiring positive press, which means you have to adopt the values of the press. <laughs> you have to think, okay, what do they want? How can I be like them? How can I please them? And at that point, you've just thrown out your values. It should really be like a just fuck them attitude. That's, that, I guess that's what I want to see, like more of a punk 
attitude. Changing the face of a medium and opening this possibility space of what's possible, it's not going to be easy. If it were easy, it would have been done already. If what you want to do is to be an innovative artist, if what you want to do is to make a difference, then of course it's hard. It should be hard. So you don't get this for free. Either you're serious about it or you're not. And if you're not, then that's fine. Do something else. But if you are, then you know, expect to, to feel the pain. I would say that you, you've got to have a thick skin if you're going to put out any kind of subversive material. You'll find allies. Or more accurately, they'll find you. People like me and um, other video game sites and writers will respect that. And we'll take notice and we'll hopefully spread the word. The people you piss off are always going to be there, whether you make a game or not. The fact that they take notice is the best publicity that you could possibly get. If you still want to do this, you should know that it's not going to be over for a long time. In the same way that the early punk rock bands influenced the course of music to come, you don't have Nirvana without early punk rock. And I think that same kind of thing is going to happen around games like Super Combine. Part of the reason that I haven't been that interested in video games is that video games haven't been doing things that are that interesting. And really experiencing the slam dance competition and looking you know, specifically at the game that was kicked out has kind of opened my eyes to you know, what you can do with role play and, and how role play can, uh, can be a useful storytelling tool. If it does anything, it may encourage people who haven't made games yet at all and are not programmers. That game designer will benefit just a little bit by having the community have the experience that they did with the Super Columbine Massacre RPG. More and more people are going to push the edges of what content is appropriate in games. We're going to see more and more games that attempt to do what Columbine does. If right now we just go ahead and make a you know, Columbine game for Sony, <laughs> they are not going to take it. If we put it on the shelf, people are not going to buy it. They wouldn't know they need it. And maybe in the future, you know, a game like Columbine game will be res well respected. And by then, I will be able to make the Columbine games <laughs> one day. I think this is an argument that we will win eventually. Under what time frame, I couldn't tell you. When Newsweek starts to rethink its position on an issue, that's a real sign. I think it'll become a part of the fabric of the history of the, the video game business. It doesn't have to be the case that Super Combine is the greatest game that was ever made. It doesn't have to be the most important game, but it, can, it will still always have its influence. So I think Columbine sets a precedent for games that, that dare to stay forward to, to declare themselves as equal artistically with films and, and in terms of cultural importance. It's stirred debate, and debate's always healthy. The controversy of what kind of content is appropriate for games has already begun, and I think that controversy is going to build into a controversy purely about whether or not games are a genuine, true art form, right? And I think that controversy is just beginning. The problem is we are not kids anymore. Right? We have grown up, we have loved the game, we, we so love it so that we want to make it. But what can we play today? As a woman who's a gamer, I feel excluded from many parts of gaming. Games have been almost solely about saving the world, rescuing princesses, killing monsters, and power fantasies. I mean, it's easier to make a game about manipulating objects and shooting weapons and driving vehicles than it is about emotion and complex feelings. If there was a way for games to demand that I feel as I'm making my choices, I think they can become a much richer medium. Those games that are rated M for mature are usually because of graphic violence, but not mature content, really. As a game developer, my goal is really to ask some of the hardest questions that I can about what topics can be covered in games. If we are not pushing it, someone else will be doing it. And luckily, we are pushing it. We want to do our best to push this media. It's going to be the indie developers, the scrappy, self-funded developers that are going to play the role of pushing, pushing the envelope thematically, even technically taking the risks to push the medium forward. We have the equivalent of Hollywood blockbusters and we have the equivalent of uh, student films, but we've got nothing in between. The real purpose behind Manifesto Games is to try to create for games what independent music and independent film provide for their respective mediums. People forget that Pong, which is sort of the birth of video games, it's 30 years ago. And if you go to the release of Nintendo, uh, which really is the modern video game era, the, the first Nintendo system released in 1985, you're talking about an industry that's 22 years old. Think about how much this industry has produced in 22 years, how far it's come. Think about where the film industry was 20 years into its existence. It wasn't doing talking movies. I think 
then in order for games to become better, that we need to demand more of them as players. That we need to become better players, in fact. Some people don't understand games at all, but even the people who understand the conventions of games may not understand that games are in fact also capable of speaking to them in, in different ways. There will be a discourse for analyzing computer games, and that, that will definitely contribute to, to putting computer games in the same uh, media level as cinema or books. I think games are the future of cinema. 50 years from now, I think cinema will be as interactive as games are now. As we go through the 21st century, interactive entertainment is going to be the relevant art form. You know, we focus on the games, the games, the games, but the game is only a vehicle for us to have an experience. I am probably the most amateur game designer in this room. I'll offer that up to you outright because it is neither where my training is nor where my future career aspirations are. <coughs> I did not expect to be sitting in front of a group of people talking about this game because I thought that it would be downloaded by 25 people and that that would be absolutely it. That's not an excuse, that's just where I was coming from. So having said all that, I think all I've done is provoke discussions like this. Look at the people around us. Fucking all these people flew in from all over the world to talk about video games. I think, like, you know, <laughs> you don't need to say any more about that. You know, it's, it's, it's not going away. And even if it does, I'm still going to make video games.